What is going on, beautiful people? Welcome back to another episode of Respect the Game podcast. My name is Edward, named after a trilogy, that being my pops. Shout out to my mother and my grandmother for helping raise me too. Please make sure you go follow at Emac Stats for all your up-to-date high school, pro, and collegiate sports coverage. We'll not disappoint. We'll keep you up to date on all that's going out there in the sports world. And always, as always, as always, it will never fail. What is a podcast without your brethren? Hey, man. Shine Heart is a charismatic hood excellence at its finest as Instagram, Twitter, SoundCloud, Cash App, Apple Pay, you name it, man. Let's go. Oh, yeah. so it's the host with the most that blows the most smoke. Black piece, the rap plug, the hip hop plug. You already know. Be sure to go check out Talking Smoke for yourself. Check it out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your dope podcast from. That's where you can find your boy at. Let's go, baby. Yeah, and for those who are listening visual, uh, listening visually. Wow, how do you do that? Oh. For those who are watching, <laughs> for those who are watching the podcast, and you're probably looking at sedations, and you're like, okay, is this a joke? What you are looking at is dedication, hard work, and belief. Our brother has been working tires tirelessly all day. Uh, got the job. He's been working relentlessly at it, and he is committed to this podcast. Even if he has fallen asleep on the introductions or before the podcast started, he is nonetheless in attendance. And if he wakes up from whatever sweet dream he's having, he's probably going to give you some good takes. Um, but you can follow him at Sedacious. Um, and this is a beautiful blooper um, for, for the ages. Let's get to the show. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> now, nah, man, so uh, this episode, man, we all all basketball, all playoffs. Um <clears throat> Before we get into the playoffs, we'll talk about some of the end of the season awards. Want to get y'all take on how y'all feel about what's going on. Uh, so we're going to start off. Uh, if you get, if it was released through the NBA, uh, the MV, MVP candidates, rookie of the year candidates, six man of the year candidates, coach of the year candidates, most improved player candidate. And the uh, we can start at defensive player of the year candidate. That was already that's already come out. By the time y'all listen to the listen to this, and the defensive award of the year, defensive player of the year was Marcus Smart. This is the first time since the '90s when Gary Payton, since a guard, has won the defensive uh, player of the year award since Gary Payton back in the '90s. Uh, sometime, what do y'all think about Marcus Smart getting the defensive player of the year? Um, I think Marcus Smart. Um. I think it's, it's well-deserved, right? Um, because I, I think they more so use the metrics that they use for determining MVP. Um, the best player on the most successful team, right, usually determines, you know, who's going to win the MVP. But, um, you know, in a defensive aspect or a defensive regard, um, they chose the best defender on the best defensive-rated team in basketball, right? So if you look at, you know, uh, Boston's overall team defense, Efficiency. Uh, they rank number one in the league um, after uh, All Star break, and it's not a coincidence that they had the best record in the league post All Star break, posting I believe twenty six and six. Um, you know that's just huge praise to Marcus, right? Um, he's always been a a stout and sturdy defender, being able to hold his own against you know bigger players in the post, and you know just more so bullying you know players out on the perimeter. So. I think it's well deserved, man. Well deserved by Marcus. And he from Texas, man. Shout out to Texas, man. You know, for sure. Uh, Darnell, what you think about Marcus Smart uh, winning the defensive defensive player of the year award, dog? Um, I feel like well deserved as a uh, Sean Hart is. I said, man. Uh, I feel like. He stepped his game up, which I'm pretty sure he's already guarding multiple positions, but he took it to a more elite level with him winning involved, of course. Um, I believe he's been doing it for the last couple of years. He's always been a defensive two-way player, but he, I feel like he even may have been, he may have even sacrificed his offense to a certain extent to where people forget that he even plays offense. So anytime you can do that to where one of your traits stands out to where people forget about other traits you bring to the table, that's definitely saying you're you're doing a great job. I mean, that, that you definitely stepped up in a certain spot. So uh, for him being able to just, you know, be on the best player on the court, to hold the best player on the court, you know, and just, um, you know, stop, especially with uh, the the West having some, some, some tough defenders, especially at uh, guards and forwards like himself, um, 
is very impressive. You know, I look at I think about players like um, Crowder and who else? Even even superstars like uh, like like Giannis Antetokounmpo that you got to worry about as far as your competition for defensive player of the year. And for you to be able to you know be little old point guard holding power forwards and small forwards and actually making a ruckus that's very impressive, man. So uh, big shout out to the little guy uh, in Boston. The reason I like Marcus Smart getting defensive player of the year is because I think a lot of times the art of on-ball defending uh, gets slighted or disrespected in the NBA, and it just it almost seems like unconsciously it just goes to, you seven feet tall, you block a couple shots, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, that's not the right. takeaway from it's not to take away from the effect that a, a big can have on the game and just, you know, contesting shots and stuff like that. But like I say, it's been since the 90s when Gary Payton, a, a guard, won the defensive player of the year. Um, and for to see it now be given to a guard, I think it's been long overdue. Um, and and I, I don't know how people feel about this, but I've thought about what if they did a – defensive player of the year award split like best defensive center or post or or and or guard uh but yeah I'm glad to see uh on ball defending on the perimeter is uh being respected uh with Marcus Smart getting the defensive player of the year award uh from the defensive player of the year award uh that's the only thing that's been a, been announced yet so far as we're doing the podcast currently for MVP uh, we talked about, we had the episode talking about MVP at the time. We was talking about Ja. We was talking about um, DeMar DeRozan, Jokic, Joel Embiid, <clears throat> Giannis. So right now for the MVP finalists, you have Giannis, you have Joel Embiid, and you have Jokic. Do y'all do y'all think any of those three guys should win it, or do y'all have a honorable mention who you feel like is more deserving than those three for the MVP award? Um, I I honestly feel as though um, Joel and B should win the award. Um, I don't feel as though they're leaving out anybody this year. Um, I feel like they've gotten it, you know, exactly right. But who I would lean towards. Uh, naturally would be um, Joel B, And the reason being is because not only his performance on the court, but how he more so um, gave leadership to the team when the, ben Simon, uh, when the Ben Simmons saga was going on, basically letting everybody know, hey, we're going to focus on the guys that are here. And, uh, you know, we're still going to be worried about winning ball games and, you know, getting to our ultimate goal, which is, you know, championship because – you know, that's that's what we play the game for. I'm a top five player in the league. And anytime you got a top five player in the league on your team, the expectations should always be around not only the playoffs, but us, you know, trying to win it all. Um, but, man, the numbers speak for themselves, man. Joel Embiid, I, I just feel like top to bottom, um, the most talented center in basketball. Yes, Jokic is a better passer than Embiid, but – you can't make an argument that Jokic is more skilled than Embiid to me. Just can't do it. From the sidestep threes, the step back threes, the hesitation off the dribble moves, the back to the basket post up game, the quick feet like a king, the dream. I mean, the guy literally has everything in the arsenal and can anchor your defense and be a candidate for defensive player of the year every year. So um, that's that's my MVP. You know, it's my story, and I'm I'm sticking to it. What you got, dude? Uh, actually, I've been watching it very closely since uh, the MVP episode we had recently. And, um, you know, all, all respect to, to Ja. It's still going to be probably my favorite player for the next up and coming years. But um, I definitely, I've definitely been bought on to the Joel and B train. He is very unstoppable. And I will disagree to say that Jokic is more skilled, but yet not unstoppable. That's why I, I'm 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 gonna have to say that you know Allen Bead is is a little bit more on the unstoppable side than skill. He he gives me more of a, a Shaq feel. Of course, not with what he does, but just like as much as I can do what I want, and it's all on me if it's gonna happen or not. There's no one really out there saying I'm gonna stop Joel Embiid today. It's Joel Embiid stopping himself or them them getting the last shot. 
uh, shout out to Kawhi Leonard. You know, like when you're playing against this guy, you got to get the last shot. There's no, oh, he's going to lose the game. Like not, not too many nights. So I'm bought onto the Joel, Joel and B train, but honestly, if Giannis um, pulls it off some kind of way, like I would not be disappointed because I've still seen like two MVPs, two defensive uh, uh, champions, two, two defensive uh, sorry, two defensive awards in a row, and you're still performing at this level and still being, still being uh, arguably a unstoppable force. You know, I wouldn't be disappointed. Like, just for him to keep going at the level he's going at, he's still getting at least 25, uh, I want to say 13 and 9. That's, that's highly impressive with the winning ability and the stoppability. Because there's other players that's doing that, but they're stoppable. You know, you got Jokic who's doing that Jokic. You have, uh, yeah, Jokic who's doing it, but they're stoppable. You have Doncic who's doing it, but they're stoppable. You know, you have a Harden who can do it, stoppable. So I feel like um, Giannis, when he's actually in his mode, he's they're unstoppable. So uh, if if Giannis were to win it, I wouldn't be disappointed. But I bought onto the Joel Embiid train, man. He's he's a, he's, a, he's a beast. Man, is, but nah, uh, <laughs> nah, man. I'm gonna have to. I mean, I I, I don't disagree with your take on who should win MVP. But the most skilled, the only thing I say, and I'm gonna get off this. Jokic, yes, better natural passer than Embiid. That is the only thing that he does better than Embiid. I'm sorry. I mean, can Jokic put the ball on the floor like Embiid can? No. Can he? Right. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. But at the okay. level of Joel Embiid, if we wanted to, and I know we probably would never ask him to do that, Joel Embiid could take the ball up the court comfortably and initiate offense and then get the ball back in the post and then go dominate somebody. And you know what I'm saying? It's just a different array of moves that he has in his arsenal and the way he can get to them. He's more athletic than Jokic. So therefore, his skill level is going to be slightly amplified due to that athleticism accompanied with the skill. Because with that athleticism accompanied with that great skill, he's going to just have the ability to do things that Jokic just can't do, right? He's not going to be an above-the-rim player like Joel B can be at times when he puts his mind to it and just threaten the defense like that. But, you know, that's all I got to say. But yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I have two honorable mentions. I'm not mad at Joel getting it. I think if he get it, it's well-deserved. But just in terms of, like, finalists or, like, guys who should, like, have serious consideration, uh, I would say uh, <clears throat> D-Book and uh, JT. Simply off the premise of just like, yes, I understand if you like a hierarchy and you average in the league and scoring, that's going to automatically put you in that MVP conversation. Um, then you have to couple that with being able to be in a winning seed uh, playoff contention, right? Uh, Joel and B has those two things. D Book is the best player on this team. They are one seed, best, best, best record in the, in the league, and he's been able to keep the team afloat, you know, despite the injury woes of, like, your point guard. Uh, is D-Book averaging 30? No. So maybe that's the distinguishing difference for some. But if he – maybe he was averaging a 30 ball, 30 clip, and, you know, there was one C, you know, that may cause for, like, more respect to be like, hey, he needs some consideration as MVP. But just, just because guys – just because guys don't struggle or suffer as much as the other person or as much as another player doesn't mean they should be ruled out of the MVP uh, conversation, especially if they're able to give you a consistent 25 to 26 and is the best player on the team and has, and has kept the team thriving despite, you know, whatever injuries may come and go throughout the season. Um, and Jason Tatum, I mean, he's been playing – out of his mind, you know, it's, for a large part of the season, he's had to deal with not having um, uh, Jalen Brown there. But one could say, well, he got help. He got the defensive player of the year on his team. You know what I'm saying? But, again, like, you shouldn't be penalized to rule out of the conversation just because you're on a well-put-together team. Uh, Giannis has been able to, like, overcome that because he's 30-12, 30-12. 
So like he gets he gets the MVP nod there. But guys like your guards, you talk about a guard finally getting MVP love. I mean defensive player of the year love. Uh you gotta also like give guards love for being able to like perform at a high level in their league because you know at the at where the league is at now, like to be able to average twenty five or twenty six and be a top top seed in the league against the guard play in the league, I think that's impressive. Uh, so just like moving forward, you know what I'm saying? Maybe they just don't have to average 30 to get in that conversation. But I think uh, I think respect should be paid to uh, D-Book as well as uh, JT. I'm going to combat that a little bit because – and not to the, and not to the fullest extent of combating, but like the reason D-Book probably wouldn't get it, and even in my opinion and probably a lot of people's eyes, is because – you forget that Chris Paul went on that masterful stretch within the regular season where it was actually people was, you know, banging the table. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> Literally. You know, for uh you know, for Chris Paul to be MVP, right? A lot of people were singing that song this year. I don't know if y'all briefly remember that, but it was, you know, a few weeks in the season where it was just, you know, man, Chris Paul is you know, literally leading this team and this, that, and the third. And mm -hmm. So anytime you have a teammate that's, you know, uh, mentioned within that light, it's automatically going to take away of your luster, so to speak, in regards to them, you know, seeing you within that light. So um, I get that. The, yeah. And I get that. I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad at that. Uh, moving on. Rookie of the Year candidates, finalists. You have Scotty Barnes, Toronto Raptors, Kay Cunningham, Detroit Pistons, Evan Mobley, Cleveland Cavaliers, Scotty Barnes with the Raptors obviously in the playoffs right now. Who would y'all give the uh, Rookie of the Year to, or do you have an honorable mention? Man, one honorable mention, man. Jalen Green got – excuse me. Jalen Green got the year wrong, bro. He, he definitely did. K. Cunningham didn't play nearly as many games as Jalen did, and yet he's a finalist. How? That seems so political to me. But Jalen Green should definitely be a finalist for his award. I mean, last 20 games of the season, the guy had let, like, let me Let me interrupt real quick. Is uh, how, as a, even though you're a rookie, right, uh, <clears throat> how much winning should be placed in the stock of rookie of the year? Should it be based off – total single performance or should winning be a factor at all for rookie of the year considering you coming in as a rookie? Hell no, nah, because as a rookie, the expectation isn't set on you to be a winner out of the gate. So nobody ever looked at the rookie of the year and was like, oh, well, his team didn't make the playoffs and he wasn't a winning, he wasn't on a winning team in a winning environment. So I'm going to go, no, it, it, come on, rookie of the year is, are you that guy or not? Are you that or are you not? Yeah. Period. That's and um, Jalen Green has consistently showed me, especially the last half of the year, that he I, finished I'm, with like forty for his last game or something of that like. Oh man, Jalen Green was on a tear, bro. People don't realize, like I say, them last twenty games. I, I charge people to look up Jalen Green's numbers post All Star break, and I guarantee you, it's some All Star numbers. And look at how, like you said, those last twenty games when Christian Wood was out and uh, a few other players from the Rockets, and he had everybody's green light. <laughs> he was awesome. Yeah. So, but was he efficient, though, with it? Hmm? It wasn't – he was efficient while doing it. It wasn't a, a sporadic hmm. streak. Either. I got 30 points on 30 shots. Nah, he, he getting 30 off, like, 18 shots, right? And then filling yeah. it up from the three, you know, he, he really, you know, turned the corner that last half of the season, so – Shout out to the hometown kid, man. No, no respect. That's just amazing to me. Right on, right on. Uh, yeah, man. <clears throat> uh, let me look at what you call it. That's briefly. I'm gonna give my man Darnell some burn on that. Oh, uh, I mean, you can interject, bro. I mean, rookie of the year. Um, I wasn't all overly impressed. Uh, I'm more of a sophomore, sophomore guy of the year, to be honest, this year. Uh, <laughs> just being honest. If not mistaken, is Jordan Poole. Is it Jordan Poole and Maxie both sophomore year? Possibly, I believe so. 
Matter of fact, let me let me fact check that real quick. I'm, I'm I got you. I got you. I got yeah, you. well, yeah, because I want to say, man, because uh, this is literally putting like the this should put all the NBA fans at 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 relaxation because people are nervous and biting their nails because everybody knows LeBron is leaving. This is the these are the signs at the time. Tim not making the playoffs. You know, like these are the signs at the times as far as the NBA goes, and and players like this stepping up. Not even being like, I don't look them look at them as superstars, but just showing like, bro, there's more ballers than just the superstars out there that's coming up. I'm very impressed. Sadiq Bay, if I'm not mistaken, also. Um, this is uh, making you a player. Is, I know that for is, sure. This is Paul's third year. year. This pool's third year, and it's Maxie's sophomore year. Okay, so I, it's really more of like, I wasn't impressed with this year, but I'm, I was more impressed with the non-stars of. Uh, these last couple years draft, you know, uh, like I said, uh, like you said, Jordan uh, Poole with Golden State and uh, Tyrese Maxey with uh, Philadelphia. I've seen they stepped up some big roles, playoff roles that I've been seeing uh, after the um, All-Star game. And I'm just like, I'm very impressed with them. I know it's about the rookie of the year, but uh, it, I mean, the couple of rookies that have actually done something are on losing teams. And I feel like it's it's I don't know I wasn't it's wasn't impressed I wasn't impressed like last couple of years man we've been spoiled with uh winners uh or or finding a way to be on a winning team with a lot of good rookies but this year it was kind of just felt like they just all send it home now like we have no chance to see no potential anything so it's just it's just a little uh, a little awkward like we've seen Ja last no not last year uh that was sophomore year so but no we we've seen a few people over the years where they gotten some playoff uh chances and it's just eh. All we had was Mobley this year. With Mobley and uh, uh, the guy out of Tor the guy playing with Toronto. Which I'm just, yeah, Barnes, I'm not really impressed with that, to be honest. I got you. I got you. Uh, rookie of the year. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it would, <clears throat> it, it wouldn't make me know, never mind who won. Rookie of the year. I like Isaac's. Uh, hold on. Oh, that's what I was supposed to do. I mean, back against the wall, someone told me, hey, pick somebody. I would definitely go with the H-Town, dude. Like, do see a bright future. Uh, like, rookie of the year. I haven't seen everybody enough, but I definitely know he put on for sure. Like like he said, he a bucket. <laughs> I, nah, uh, I like the confidence. Yeah, I like the charismatic nature in the interviews, but don't nothing really be charisma like Anthony Edwards. The guy is just – I know that ain't got nothing to do with nothing, but uh, the guy is Is that just, another third-year guy or second-year guy? Is, I, uh, believe it or not, Isaac, they was right there, Nick and Nick. Jalen Green, 67 games played. K, 64 games played. He Still played more. more, though. That's all he said. <laughs> Still more. <laughs> played more. Uh, all I'm saying. Uh, no, nah, that's real. That's real. Uh, six man of the year. I feel like this is, to a degree, unanimous. Um, you got for the candidates Tyler Hero, Cam Johnson from the Suns, and Kevin Love from the Cavs. Uh, K Love taking that veteran role and coming off the bench, uh, letting the young guys get their burn, coaching up in Evan Mobley, who's a, a rookie of the year candidate. Who's y'all six man of the year? <laughs> six man definitely got to go to you know, I don't know if he's a neighborhood hero, but he definitely, you know, <laughs> my bro. But yeah, Tyler Hero, man, he's been a model of consistency, averaging over 20 points per game uh, on a Miami Heat team that, you know, featured, you know, two all-stars. is pretty tough. Um, a fringe all-star, if you want to count Kyle Lowry in his peak years, obviously not anymore right now, but, you know, um, you know, still having the production that he had on a winning team, on a top team in the East, that's nothing to scoff at, right? So, I think rightfully so. He should he should walk away with that candidly. I don't think that's really even a, a a question, or I don't think anybody is beating on their chest for anybody else to win it. How you feel, D? I'm sorry. Which one was it again? Six man of the year. Not Tyler. Six. Oh, man. Tyler for sure. Who will? Tyler for sure. <laughs> Tyler for sure. Uh, I've I've uh, seen a couple of games. I've seen a couple of games. I've uh, seen a couple of stat sheets on his games, and man, and, uh, he's putting up like thirty points off the bench, twenty five points off the bench, really doing 
everything he was doing a couple of times he was starting, um, I think his rookie or sophomore year. And it's, I like the fact that he's young. A lot of not a lot of players, but a few players when they do win, they're kind of already like established in the game. I like the fact that he's doing it's like his third or fourth year. He's actually becoming a six man. Um, usually that's like a, a demoted role from a starter that probably was already leading the team and they kind of said they're gonna sec- they lead the second uh team. Nobody's usually uh jumping up and down to be the sixth man. So uh that's uh I think it was I think it was a very smart move by him by accepting that challenge from the coach. Usually when that happens, that's a, that's a challenge from the coach, especially being a rising prospect as he is. So uh, I, I, I like Tyler Hero for sure, man. Uh, who was his competition one more time, just to be more for certain for certain? Okay, I'll give it to you with the stats. So obviously Tyler Hero averaging 20 points, five rebounds, four assists. Then you got Cam Johnson, who's on the best team in the league, that being the Phoenix Suns, averaging 12, 12 points, four rebounds, and one assist. Then you got Kevin Love, who just missed the playoffs uh, by a play-in game, averaging 13 points, seven rebounds, and two assists. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a starter that's not starting. So uh, with, with not more, the same amount of minutes at that. <laughs> yeah, e- even more impressive to heroes, averaging 20 points a game. Sometimes, and I, I feel, and it could be just recently recency bias, just in my mind. I feel like over the years, sometimes that six man of the year award goes to like the six man coming off like that best team in the league uh, bench, and then sometimes you have your guys who lights out, you know, like you say, get starter minutes or probably leading the team uh, with points, like a Lou Will, like possibly a Jamal Crawford. You know what I'm saying? Coming up back in the day and Tyler Hero averaging a, a consistent 20, 20 clip off the bench is extremely impressive. Very, very extremely impressive. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's – rebounds and four assists. I'm pretty Nine. sure James Harden is the only other um, youngest six man in that area, I want to say. I would think James Harden, at least the most recent one. So we oh, get that award. Like how old? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. Uh, yeah, man. So, uh, six man of the year, we're going to cross it over to most improved player of the year. Now, I have to ho- tell Izzo, Sean Hart, Izzo, the hardest horses, because he definitely had grievance with the most improved player uh, finalist. Uh, most improved player finalist, Darius Garland, John Morant, DeJounte Murray. I'll let, I'll let Izzo go last. Darnell, do you have... Uh, do you have a uh, – who do you like out of Darius Garland, John Morant, DeJounte Murray, or do you have an honorable mention for most improved player of the year? Now, this might sound funny, but I feel like it goes a little bit more to Garland because he was in more of a situation that was a little bit more on the actual, like, you need to improve. Like, John Morant was more on, like, bro, it's bound to happen. It just happened. I respect Garland a little bit more because, like, you weren't in the playoffs last year. You were on this team that nobody thought was going to get, you know, bounce back. You know, not only that, but you're leading in the points and everything. Like, you're, you're, you're carrying this team with a few veterans on it, which, which you don't have to. Like, you can let them carry. You can let uh, Jared Allen carry. You can let Kevin Love carry the team. But they – you can let Callis LeVert carry the team. But they got you as a young buck carrying the team. I'm just like – And also, too, uh, you know, a guy – It's impressive. A guy – I'm sorry, a guy who was also, like, leading the reins of this team, but he got injured, Colin Sexton. So, like, Darius Garland has been able to assume that role. Exactly. Like, he wasn't even necessarily supposed to be that guy to to, to be the one. He may have been, like, a, a duo type stuff like they did in Portland, but he wasn't – they wasn't planning on him being the guy. But he said, you know what, I'm going to step up and I'm I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over. And, and that's the only reason why I like Moran, obviously, but it's just, like – that was destined for Morant to have the year he was having, in my opinion. Like, there was no most improved. It was just like, that's like giving most improved to LeBron James a year. Like, that was supposed yeah. to happen. Like He had a, a greater statistical year than he's used to having. The fact that they got John Morant on there is absolutely ridiculous. It's a mm, highway robbery to Jordan Poole, like, literally in the, in the highest order. How did... <laughs> How is I, the give, man you, I give you hell. I give you hell. <laughs> yeah, it's like, bro, how in the – bro, John Morant is 
he in the MVP race too, and then the most improved. I'm like, damn, can we pick one and, and you know get a solidified spot? But I just feel as though the most improved player is not uh, slated for a, um, you know, a star of John Moran's caliber because he'd already proven that he was a young budding star in the league. But the fact that the NBA just saw like, hey, you know, Jordan Poole just. You know, like, it, it's just, it's baffling to me. And I get it, right? This was the year Clay came back. You know, Steph started off the season super hot. You know, I, I get it. I get it. I, I understand. I get it. But are we watching who this man has become? He is, Jordan Poole has positioned himself to, and I don't think this is hyperbole, he is going to get maxed out. He is going to receive a max contract. And if Golden State does not go into the luxury tax to pay him, another team will be willing to give him that without blinking with the season that he just had. And don't let him have anywhere close to the success he had this year. It's done. That's that's signed, sealed, delivered. Like, so you're talking about four potential max players on your team because Draymond Green is on a $100 million extension. Klay Thompson got that extension prior to the injury. Steph Curry just got extended 200-some-plus million. So Jordan Poole is going to be looking like, man, I just won the free throw title. I'm a better free throw shooter technically than Steph this year. And I'm shooting 40% from three. And I'm averaging – is he averaging close to 20? Uh, let me look you up. Uh, let me look you up. Uh, to and I think with that, we're close to 20 points per game. And that's on a team like that, if you averaging 20 with all of those. 18, 18, 18.5. And I'm going to take it. And I'm going to take mm -hmm. that. That's close enough. Because that's that sound about right with, you know, the ball that you have to, you got to share that with Steph. You got to share that with Clay. Um, You know. Uh, to give y'all his, uh just his jump, just progression over a year period. So. Like I say, this is his junior year, came into the league 2019, you know, playing through the G League and stuff. Uh, so averaging 18 and 5 this year, last year he was only averaging 12. Now, granted, he was only getting 19 minutes per game, uh, but this year he's getting 30 minutes per game. Then you add that with the Steph injury. Um, yeah, he's averaging 18 points, three rebounds, and four assists this season. Last year he was only averaging 12 points, one rebound, one assist. And he was doing uh, – and his points – his production was lower than that when he first came in his rookie year. And when you got Mike Green calling you the third splash, brother, I'm sorry. That bang! Yeah, man, the bang man himself before he – Baby splash. Hey, man. But, all right, so 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 here's just, – just for whatever conversation to be on the other side – how fair of an argument is it to say, well, the curse that Jordan Poole has in terms of, like, not being able to appreciate or see his improvement is because he's around, like, that stargazing la-la land in Golden State of the Splash Brothers. I know you could say, well, there ain't all – They just started there. playing a couple months ago, so it's like he was doing that, you know, before Clay came on the scene this year, so it's like – it's to, to my point, I think it's more impressive that he's doing it with them on the court. One thousand percent, one one hundred and thousand percent. But I think I think what it is, I think people are more are people more enamored with it's all three of them doing it flawlessly, or are they more enamored with Jordan Poole? I think that's a good question. I think it's I think it's both respectfully right the fact that they actually have a legitimate third option on offense who one would might say could possibly be the second option right now how it's looking but you know I won't dare disrespect Clay the man who got 60 and three and, and I, won't, I, won't <laughs> ever, I won't ever disrespect that man so solidify third option for sure on a on a future Hall of Fame backcourt, the best shoot backcourt ever, and you a solidified third option, and they calling you, you know, the third splash, brother. I don't know if they the new name you give them, but you know, hey man, Jordan Poole, it's a pool party, a show. Bring the family, bring the kids. I think what helps, I, I some people, 
whoa, wait a minute. Oh, okay, rookie of the year. I was like, wait a minute. There's Garland and Evan Mobley both most improved. Uh, but Evan Mobley is rookie of the year finalist. But uh, I do I do side with Darius Garland getting most improved now that he's on that list. Um, with the fact that he had to step up with Connor Sexton being out for the year, and that catapulted you know catapulted him to All Star level, and with the success that they're having, being actually you know, I think um, that's the biggest is I think like you said and I thought it uh, I think that's the biggest uh, push over the top was like he was an All Star this year. Yeah, Dante <laughs> Curry was too, but Cavaliers had way more team success than the Spurs did this year. One thousand percent, yeah. They had a, well, yeah, success, but both teams finished in, in the play in. Play, yeah, finished in the play in. Both teams oh, finished in the All play right. in. Well, let's. Okay, Garland, so. Garland, Garland, yeah, Darius Garland averaged twenty one points, three rebounds, eight assists this year. Uh, Dejounte Murray. DeJounte averaged 21 points, eight rebounds, and honest. He down to average tri triple double this year. So, yeah. Question. Question. How much is uh, Trey Maxi go? Trey Maxo got? Bro, he's not even a finalist. No, I'm saying, what was his jump? Oh, he came behind okay. Ben Simmons. Okay, okay. I got you. I literally about to try, type in a Trey Maxo. <laughs> <laughs> that, that trigger, hey, Trigger Maxo. That's his name, uh -huh. bro. Uh -huh. Trigger uh -huh. Maxo. Uh -huh. You his frame, motherfucker. Yes, sir. New Trigger Maxo. Let's go. I like okay. it. I know he probably is. So he should be a fire. Again, this is Tyrese Maxi's sophomore year. So last year he came in as a rookie. Uh, average ah, 15. that's right. Average 15 minutes a game. Uh, on 15 minutes per game, he averaged eight points, one rebound, two assists. This year, uh, averaging 35 minutes a game, he's now averaging 17 points, three rebounds, and four assists. So that was his jump. Ooh. Ooh. Luckily, he, I think if he wasn't a rookie, he may have been he may have been put up in there. But he's a rookie. It was because he's a sophomore year. That's why they did him like yeah. that. I know that's why. I feel I feel you though, uh, Black Peace. Trying to make sure you got um, give your boy Trigger Maxo some uh some love on the most improved. But now nah, it's only because he's a rookie. Yeah, I was like, when they like, damn, boy been turned up. Like, oh nah, he's because he's he's a sophomore coming off his rookie year. This is what happens. Yeah, so can't uh, it didn't work that way. True indeed, true indeed. Right. So uh, next up. We did most uh, – we did MVP, did rookie of the year, did six man of the year, did defense player of the year, did most improved player. Uh, I'll do this one differently. Off y'all – off the top of y'all here, give me y'all coach of the year. Hmm. Uh, awesome. I'll and then I'll tell y'all the finalists. To the – to the – to the – to the black man in Boston, I'm going to just say that. Yeah, man, his team has had the guy. best number one rated defensive team in the league. A, a, a dramatic change from when uh, Brad Stevens was the head coach there. And um, he has tapped into the talent that he has, and he has utilized it and maximized it to the point of where people are actually picking Boston against the Nets due to the fact that they play defense at a high level. The chemistry that's there. And it's led by the two wing, you know, monster of, you know, Tatum and Brown. So I, you know, for the team success and then him having a player that wins defensive player of the year based off of principles that he has brought to that team specifically and it bearing fruits as, you know, Marcus Smart being the defensive player of the year this year. I don't think that's by accident. I think it's because of this coach and the way he has got and galvanized these guys and got them to believe. Um, he, he's got to be coach of the year candidate. And if it ain't him, hey, man, you know what I'm thinking. Reed. Uh, Emma Yadoku, yes. he uh, – I would like to see him. And, like, some people tried to slight him and be like, oh, you know, you got Tatum. Bro, Brown was gone for a very nice chunk of the season. 
And he had to rally the troops and keep that together, not to mention just like the turnaround. And this is your first year coming in. You implementing a whole new system, whole new philosophy. You got like you a rookie coach. Like you got to get guys to be investing into your system and what you got going on. And you got to do that with uh, all stars. I don't think that I don't think that should be a sniff that um, in the slightest. But unfortunately, he is not a coaching uh, coach a finalist for coach of the year in the NBA. The finalist list for coach of the year consists of Taylor Jenkins from the Memphis Grizzlies, Eric Spoelstra with the Heat, and Monty Williams uh, with the best record in the league for the Phoenix Suns. Who do y'all think should get it out of uh, those three? Uh, despite our honorable mention of Ime Yudoku. Ime Yudoku ain't no? Oh, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, wow. he's not on here. Like I say, Taylor Jenkins with the Grizz, Eric Sposher with the Heat, Monty Williams with the Suns. The Grizzlies coach is going to win it because of all the that Memphis done had this year. But it's criminal. I think they're worrying about the wrong things when it comes down to this coaching, in my opinion. I feel like they should have worried. Oh, my bad. I feel like they should have worried about. Um, a chemistry should have played something in it. I feel like the chemistry was the main thing that we got built up in Boston. And we even like the players, pretty much the same players, maybe like a little, a little minor adjustment here and there. But I kind of feel like Memphis, they were just young. I felt like um who was it? Who was it? You just said it. Monty Williams. The Suns. I thought the Suns, that was that's that's respectable. And then you have the Heat. I feel like the Heat, that's off the fact that they, they don't have one true, true leader that's just dominating and scoring or any particular uh, role to where they feel like the coach is just doing a hell of a job. So that's how I feel about it. I feel like the coach in Boston, they had an issue with winning, like actual well, winning, and they had the same exact team. So that's why I feel like he should have got too, it. Also, too, I think for his team to be as great as they are, uh, as good as they are, and for him to also have to deal with the focus of keeping his wife happy, I think, like, he, he without a doubt should be coach of the year. Like, you got to be the coach of the Boston Celtics, and you got to make sure you keep your wife and Neil Long happy. That man needs coach of the year. <laughs> he did it. He made huh? it alone? Yeah. He made it alone? He already went. <laughs> <Fast. laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh man. Uh Great just so we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, man. Uh so yeah, man. So that goes uh, you know, MVP Rick of the Year, six man defense player of the year, most improved, uh, and yeah, most improved of the year and coach of the year. Uh first round as we're doing this play, uh as we're doing this playoffs, as we're doing this episode. Uh, honorable mention, Sedacious is still asleep. I would pay to see his face when he finally wakes up. <laughs> uh, but as we're doing this episode, game two, all game twos, no, that's a lot, not all game twos, but game two is going on at tip-off with the Phoenix Suns and the uh, New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, fellas, whatever series, what has been the most interesting series for y'all? What has been the most interesting uh, game plan y'all have seen? Uh, shocker, surprises, NBA uh, championship prediction yet or favorite or whatever. I know we didn't do it like fully legit before the playoffs, but you know, it is what it is. Most interesting series has to be Boston and the Nets with a close second right now as it's shaping up uh, T-Wolves and Grizzlies. But then in regards to just if we're making determinations already about who we think is gonna win it all, man. I think I might have to ride with Drake, man. I, I, I just man, them warriors, they're coming in the rare form at the right time again. And granted, Jordan Poole is not Kevin Durant, but that death lineup that they have, people still sleep on Wiggins. Wiggins made an all-star team this year. You know, you're going to have legit three all-stars on the court at, you know, I mean, four if you want to count Draymond's all-star years and then the all-star level Jordan Poole is playing at. Like, that is a lethal lineup that you can use to close out games or just get ahead. That lineup, I think it's a stat out there, 
they outscored. They scored seventy points in like twenty minutes. Was it? Was it? I, f- I forget. It was, I don't know. I, this stat may not be that, but it's in that ballpark. So, out of the two championship teams that they had, this team has like the highest like net efficiency by like plus one hundred twenty plus something. Wow. Compared to like the championship team with KD and the other championship squad, so championship to me. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, yeah, nah. I think um, for me, an interesting series. I think. Well, as I say this, um, I may be thinking differently. <laughs> now, I still think it's an interesting uh, series, Minnesota and. Uh, the Grizzly, I think Minnesota still in game one was huge. I feel like had they lost tonight, they would be really flirting with, like, sweet territory going back to Minnesota. But as it is right now, Memphis is only up uh, – Memphis is up 70 to 51. Um, midway through the third, top of the third. So we'll see how that shakes out. That's an interesting series. Um, but uh, I think – I wouldn't be surprised if that series went seven. And the chess piece, if we playing chess, right, I feel like, obviously, depending on what type of chess player you are, but to the world, for people who, I guess, follow chess overall, we all know that, like, the queen is, like, no more uno in terms of just being able to make any move, however, you know, you see fit, in, you know, to protect the king. And the Dallas Mavericks and the Utah Jazz series, I feel like that queen that everybody's focused on and trying to like pay attention to to see how they're going to move, metaphorically speaking, through the game of chess, <laughs> is uh, Luca. Uh, Luca has yet to play in the series. The series is kind of tied 1 1, and it's going back to Utah. Dallas at home court. Series going back to Utah, I say game three, Luka doesn't play. And if they lose, Luka plays game four. Uh, So I think it's kind of like double dutch. Like, is Luka going to jump in and play or not? So it'll be interesting to see when Luka and or if Luka ever returns in this series. uh, You know, Jalen Bronson. That's it. Uh, slated to return either game three or four, and I think it's depending on exactly what you said, if they can win that or not. Right. Yeah, so when Luka comes back, I wonder what how that's going to affect that game and the X's and O's of that. Um. So, yeah, the – I didn't think – I heard uh, – I was listening to Gilbert Arenas talk about this, and I think he wants – I don't know if this is the full sentiment, of why he wants uh, the Nets to beat the Celtics. Um, but when I thought about it, I was like, I wouldn't mind saying that either. It, it, it would put the Celtics by the wayside, but meeting in the, I want to say the Eastern Conference Finals, the Sixers and the Nets. So if the Nets can knock off the Celtics and meet the Sixers in the Eastern Conference Finals, and what if Ben Simmons is like decided to start playing by the end? Oh, oh God. God. bro, that that's 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 get your pop. That's a hey, bro. That's that's must see television. That's must see television. <laughs> so uh, so that's you know it's just a little taste of like you know how I'm feeling and the vibes that I'm feeling going into the uh, like looking at the playoffs thus far with most teams almost through uh, almost pretty much done uh, with their second game of the uh, of the series. Um. Yeah. Uh. But black piece, like what you see out there, and uh, on the on the playoff landscape, this uh got your eye. Definitely something that's definitely got my eye. Um, Nikolai Jokic. Uh, I think we've all seen that this man is struggling there in Denver. We're about to really see him actually at a point where he's about to start talking to the uh guys in the office and hey man, I need help. I feel like personally, he doesn't. I don't think he believes that Jamal Murray coming back off the injury, if if, if that's an option, that that's going to work. I think he needs high caliber. I think he needs a clutch shooter. I think he needs a person from Oak Town. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna leave it right there. I'm gonna let the you know the fans figure that out. And I feel like that'd be a winning solution 
But right now, I'm paying attention because you see how much work he has to do. It's not even – I feel like basketball at this point for Nikolai Jokic is not fun. It's not fun anymore. And that's one thing you don't want out of your star player. Do You want to keep them having fun with something they love to do. And I feel like at this point, it's, it's work. And it's not Bro, good kind of work. It is 1,000% work. It is not fun. It's not for leisure. He comes in, like, every day, every possession, like, I have to make every single play or this offense is not going to stand the test of time. Exactly. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm noticing that, like, last couple of years, you know, the team was slightly stronger. The chemistry was, like, you know, a little bit more perfect. And they had good opportunities. But now it's like, this is the worst that they're at. You're counting on a point guard coming back off the of injury. And it, it's, it's just, I feel like they need somebody a little bit more, you know, uh, impactful. Uh, I'd rather, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to say that person's name because I feel like the fans that watch our show know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, he may be laying, you know, in his condo in, in Portland maybe or possibly in Oakland. And I'm going to leave it at that, okay, people? But like I say, De- Jokic definitely needs help in this series. Is definitely about to show him, like, it's, it's undeniable that he needs another powerhouse on his team right now because the Golden State Warriors is the standard. And you can't be the yeah. Golden State Warriors or at least give them a challenge there's no hope for your team. You can't give them a, a fight, there's no hope. You might as well just scrap everything and figure it out all over again because uh, this doesn't stop, especially with Jordan Poole on the rise. This 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 foot on the neck mentality is not going to stop with Golden State. So, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I got my eye. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, uh, it's the same conversation with the guy in Oakland, like you say. Uh, for European players, right, I don't know, and I and just you know, like check me and like refresh my memory if I'm wrong. But I don't know if elite superstar foreign players are boisterous about leaving or like yo going to management and it being voiced out in the media. They want such and such player here. Like I don't know if Jokic is the type of guy that goes out in the off season if he's not at his home country and try to recruit players. You know what I'm saying? Denver could be so funny. Kristop, Kristop Porzingis did it, and look where he's at. So I will say he may be a no, 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 no. Maybe had that in the back very, of his no. head. I was very strategic in saying superstar foreign players. Kristaps Porzingis is no, oh, nobody. Oh. Huh? For a very brief breath, he was a superstar. For a very brief breath. Who? Brief. You can't say brief for Chris Osborne. He was never a brief superstar, Darnell. I, hey, based on the hype of the energy we bring to the table, well, I, the productivity was, on the court I, I personally have not seen him be this amazing the guy, but just the energy. I'm not going to say him not this man 100,000%, <laughs> but the hype, I nah. definitely say the hype. Was the hype was, was there. The hype, oh, my God, guy. The hype was there. The productivity on the court was not. So he wasn't a superstar in that regard. But I don't know if Jokic goes out from his home country in the offseason and tries to recruit guys. Um, it's been said that once the season is over, like, you don't, you really don't hear from Jokic. So it's time for training camp. He goes away in his hibernation, drinks beers, gets out of shape, and he's ready to – and he'll use, the, he'll yeah. use the spring training to get back in shape. And, like, he's off to the races to try to be another MVP. Um, Denver is probably resting their loins on – Hey, when we get Jamal Murray back, when we get Jamal Murray back, like, I think I want to, like, could it be a year and a half or is it going on two years since we've seen Jamal Murray play? Like, I feel like I hadn't seen him play since the bubble. bubble. Yeah. (laughs) And so, um, so, so, like, that's tough. Um, So, yeah, man, I don't, I don't think Jokic will force his way out. And I don't think the guy from Oakland would force his way out. Um. But to be honest with you, bro, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't even, like, put it on just, like, those two having holy matrimony. As you see, like, you need a – I don't think nobody's just going to magically find a Jordan Poole, but, like, you need your maxi. You need you, like, a pool to, like, you know, couple that with, you know what I'm saying? Um, Yeah, but, nah, watching Jokic play is very depressing. I feel like the Warriors know he has no help. We would just beat him. So he is black and blue, 
and we don't care about him kicking it out. Like we don't like we are just gonna beat him up. And I think that's been the game plan. I think Jokic is frustrated because he literally has no one to turn to. He can't take a break for too long. And even if you think you're gonna weather the storm of the Golden State Warriors in the first half, the rain is coming. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna say this real quick so we can wrap it up, possibly. Um I feel like this has the same energy as the same thing that started the the big three. Those players that started that big three were not cop out players at all. They were They're loyal just, as they came. But they uh, came, they came way at the end, not in their prime in their peak. But you're you're talking about a player right now who I just literally said everybody in the world can see the frustration. Like you gotta do something for him. And you see another player who's uh Oh, I want to incriminate him, but he just seems like he's not happy. and He's just not too enthusiastic in the position that he's in. So I'm just like, it ain't like, oh, we're just happy and they're just making us such happy guys. Like, no, they're not happy. It's a difference. Like, they were happy and the organization was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Then I'll say, okay, loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. But I'm like, nah, man. Like, people ain't – what did what did he say right after the playoffs that they got eliminated last year? Uh, how long do I stay loyal before – it was a Dipsy bar. You oh, know, how long but, uh, was they meets preparation. Exactly. How long am I gonna keep waiting when I'm already prepared? When like y'all like, like what's up? Like you gotta meet this me halfway. I feel like not trying to put me in an opportune situation. And that's exactly what was kind of happening with Boston to a certain extent with the big three. Like, like Paul Pierce was like, bro, y'all ain't giving me nothing. What's up? Same thing with Kevin Garnett. Like y'all giving Paul me Pierce everything, is, but it just ain't working. Paul Pierce was yeah. on record saying before that trade, before like the big three came together. He was trying to get to. Uh, he was trying to get the Dallas to rock out with dirt. Either, like, like I said, either, either way, it's like a certain point. Like they were older, yes, but at the end of the day, it was a prideful time in the NBA where you had to like, you had to be Kobe by yourself. That's the thing, too. People were like that's people were like we got to be Kobe. We got we got to beat certain players by ourselves, or we got to beat these defensive uh, juggernauts by our like, you know, by ourselves. And people just got tired of trying to beat Detroit trying to beat the Heat, trying to beat, you know, LeBron when he was budding into a superstar that he is. So, I mean, that's that's what happened. And I feel like it's just right now, the game is elevating so fast. Like, that that that, that time is now for, like, stars to, like, get, like, dude, it's about to get crazy. If you ain't on no good team, you better get on one now because it ain't getting no better. It's, as you can see, Maxi Poole, uh, the rookies, all these players are stepping up, and they making they, they, they names known. So, uh, you want a championship? Do it now for that. Chem these chemistries get out of hand before New Orleans become the top a top five seed, because they they trying to squirm their way up there to being a top five six seed, not playing for the play in no more. And like I just and, and they got Zion ready to apparently come off act a fool, hopefully for their organization's sake. So I'm just saying, like right now, it's. It's a faster paced game. So right now be the time to, to, to link up. Ain't no waiting to the end of your career, bro. Like <laughs> you're wasting your time. Swallow your pride. Like, like we got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving playing together for Christ's sakes. Like we have uh like like the, the combinations of winning some of players together is like it's getting out of hand, bro. Golden State. Um Shoot, man! Like uh, the the whole Suns organization. <laughs> Pretty sure they're 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 help their uh the medical staff can win a game. Like you know what I'm saying? Like the way the, the game is right now, it, it's like it's it's making a beautiful playoff. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, beautiful people. That is what we call a great episode, man. Please continue to tune in. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, make sure you comment, like, share, subscribe on YouTube, as well as Spotify, as well as Apple Podcasts, at Sean Hart Izzo, at Black underscore Peace, Black, B-L-A-Q-U-E, at Sedacious. Uh, hope he has a great night's rest. At Max. <laughs> we will see you beautiful people next week.